Hey there, Stella students. Jacob Burton here from StellaCulinary.com. And I'm really excited to bring you this video because in this video, we're going to take your sauce making to the next level. Now, in a previous video, we laid the foundation for this sauce making video, and we talked about the five French mother sauces, which are Espanol, Volute, Bechamel, Sauce Tomate, and Hollandaise. Now, the reason why I'm so excited to bring you this video is because the past series that we've been doing, which started with the flavor structure PDF, then the introduction of flavor lecture and the secrets to salt lecture, and then our last lecture, the five French mother sauces, they were all laying the foundation for this video that we're gonna shoot here, which is actually going to teach you how to create any sauce you want from a very technical standpoint. Now, it's important that you have a firm grasp on flavor structure for this to make sense. And this video is not for the faint of heart, okay? There's a lot of issues that we need to discuss in this video, a lot of concepts that we need to work our way through. And I'm not gonna break this up into a series because I want you to watch this video straight through to really get the information that you need. So if you're not into long lecture videos, then hit the stop button, go away, don't watch it, I don't know. But this is the only way that I know of to convey to you this information that you're going to need to master sauce making and to create your own sauces, all right? So crack yourself a soft drink or a beer, put your feet up, let's spend some time together. So at the end of my last video, I mentioned that although it's important to understand the five French mother sauces, they're also a blunt object for teaching people how to create sauces. See, because the whole purpose, at least in my opinion, of teaching people how to cook is not to make a bunch of recipe machines. It's to give them the tools and the foundation they need to go out and create their own recipes so they can express themselves through their food. And that's what my mission at Stella Culinary is all about. Now, a very important part of creating your own dishes is, of course, being able to make amazing sauces. Now, although the five French mother sauces are important to understand, my biggest issue with them, as far as a teaching tool goes, is they're extremely redundant. You learn these sauces, you memorize the secondary components that go into these sauces, and then you memorize what those sauces are supposed to be served with. And three out of the five mother sauces are essentially the same sauce. Espanol, Volute, Bechamel, liquid thicken with roux, liquid thicken with roux, liquid thicken with roux, sauce tomate, liquid sometimes thicken with roux, and sauce tomate has like three or four derivatives. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's a tomato sauce with pork product and mirepoix. Now, it's nice to know this sauce and to be able to stew something in it. But sauce tomate is still a tomato-based sauce that, quite frankly, is often thickened with the roux. So four of the five French mother sauces are liquid thickened with roux. Very redundant. So you make these sauces, you make the derivatives, it's not teaching you anything new. It's all memorization work. Hollandaise is the only one that really breaks the mold, where Hollandaise is an emulsion. Egg yolks with clarified butter or whole butter whisked in with some other secondary flavor components and you get hollandaise. So this is not a good way to learn how to make sauces, no matter which way you slice it. And when I was developing my curriculum for my boot camp, I thought to myself, there's no way I'm gonna be able to take these people's sauce game to the next level in the five days that they have to spend with me. It's just not gonna happen. It took me years to figure out my approach to sauce making. And I had to really rethink, how am I gonna teach people how to make sauces? Well, I can't do it based on the five French mother sauces, because number one, they're too redundant. And number two, it just, it doesn't teach you enough about how to compose a sauce. What it teaches you to do when you memorize the five French mother sauces and their derivatives, what it teaches you to do is to be a recipe machine. You look up a, a sauce recipe in your book, you copy it down, and you put it with whatever protein or vegetable that sauce recommends that you put it with. So instead, to break that mold and to give people the framework and the foundation that they need to create their own sauces and really any sauce they could ever dream up, 
I came up with a technical approach to sauce making, which I lovingly refer to as the three modern mother sauces. Now where this approach differs from the traditional five French mother sauce approach to teaching sauce making is that instead of giving you base recipes and then derivative recipes and hoping that one day you'll make enough of them and make enough connections to understand how to create your own sauces on the fly, instead I give you three technical approaches to sauce making because my argument is any sauce that you will ever make, any sauce that you could possibly dream up will be made with one of three techniques. And those techniques are reduction, emulsification, and puree. And once you understand the science behind each of these techniques, how each of these techniques work, and the best practices, then all you have to do is paint flavor structure over the top of one of these techniques, and you can create any sauce that you would ever want. Now, this is where we need to pause and talk about something that we've touched on briefly in this series. You know, I gave you that flavor structure PDF. I gave you the, uh, the introduction to flavor structure lecture series, and we talked about uh, some flavor structure in that video. Now, the reason why I gave it to you is because it's really important for you to understand flavor structure before walking into this video. So if you haven't already, pause this video and go download uh, the flavor structure, or F is for flavor, PDF, at stellacolinary.com slash flavor, okay? And when you come back, then you're gonna better understand our next step in this process. So my approach in the F-step curriculum, which I use at my boot camps, is to have a very formulaic way of teaching things and a very formulaic way of approaching food. It's not this ethereal, hard to grasp concept of, oh, I'm a culinary artist and you know, you just weren't lucky enough to be born as creative as I am. So I can walk into a kitchen and I can create things because I'm this artist. And no, that's total BS. Quite frankly, it's just, it's not true. Anybody can cook because cooking is a technical thing. It's something that you learn and it, you practice and as you become better at it, then you become a better cook. And there's a formula to being an awesome cook. There's a formula to being creative. Now the base formula that I teach is what I call the F-step formula. And the F-step formula is flavor plus technique in parentheses times execution equals any dish or sauce you will ever create. Now we are gonna talk more about this in an upcoming video, but I just wanna put this up here because this applies to our current video as far as how to make an amazing sauce. Any sauce that you ever make is gonna be flavor structure plus technique. Now the reason why I put flavor structure plus technique in parentheses and multiply by execution is because you could have one of the best flavors ever. You could have one of the highest end ingredients ever that has a beautiful flavor and you could apply a decent sauce making technique to it. But if you can't execute it, if you stumble when it comes time to serve that sauce because you're not using best practices, it doesn't matter how good your flavor structure or your technique is. Okay, so it's important to keep that in mind. But in this video, we're focusing more on the flavor structure plus technique portion of our overall formula, which we'll talk more about in our next video, okay? So these are the three techniques that you will use to create any sauce that you can imagine. Reduction, emulsification, and puree. Now when creating a new dish or a new sauce, so you're not starting with a cookbook, you're just starting with an idea. And the first thing you're gonna do when you create a new sauce is, say, is start with an ingredient. And what is that ingredient? That ingredient is flavor. Flavor, that's the first part of your, your F step, or that's the first part of your cooking equation. It's spring, the English peas look beautiful. The Delta asparagus looks beautiful. I wanna do something with English peas. I wanna do a dish with English peas because I feel inspired by it. Right? So you're starting with a flavor. Now you take that flavor and you apply technique to it. Well, what do we know about English peas? Well, English peas are green. Yes, duh. So that means they have chlorophyll. That means they need to be blanched. They need to be blanched in boiling salted water and then chilled in an ice bath. Because if they're not, then you're not going to be able to preserve that color and preserve that flavor when you later go on and cook it. All right? So you're starting with a flavor. Now it's time to apply technique like blanching and figure out how you want to enhance that flavor. So that's why in the F is for flavor PDF I gave you, we talked about secondary flavor components, right? How to choose 
these secondary flavor components to add to your primary flavor, in this case our English pea example, you know, you could add mint, uh, you could add white pepper, uh, you could add all sorts of various items, olive oil, uh, that goes good with these green English peas to help you create your sauce. Now the example of the English peas is just something I threw out there because it's spring at the time of shooting this video and the English peas are just now looking gorgeous, right? So I had them on my mind. So I'm thinking to myself, I wanna do something with the English peas. So what if I wanna do an English pea sauce? What if I wanted to incorporate that into a dish or do an English pea soup, right? And, and a soup is basically just a sauce that you eat in mass quantities. So I look at these three techniques and I say to myself, well, what is the best application of that technique for that flavor? Because your job as a chef is to always hold up that primary flavor, that primary ingredient, okay? It is the star of your dish and it's why you cook. You don't want to fuss around with it so much that you destroy that product's integrity. So you start with the good ingredient. So you take your fresh English peas and you know, like we said, hey, they're going to break down if we don't, if we don't blanch them. If we overcook them too long, they're going to be mushy and have a you know, army green, grayish brown color. That's not very appetizing. All right. So something like a reduction, and we'll talk more about this in a second, but something like a reduction, what, what are you doing with a reduction? Well, with a reduction, you are reducing. So you're adding heat over a long period of time. You're slowly concentrating flavors by reduction. But let's think of our English peas. What would happen if we took our English peas and we put them in water, we made a stock with them, and then we reduced them over hours and hours and hours and hours? Well, they're going to lose that bright, fresh flavor, that fresh spring uh, English pea flavor, and the color is going to be awful. We're not going to have that bright green color anymore. So in this case, in this example, because we randomly, randomly chose English peas to do something with, to create a sauce with it, we're not going to choose reduction because reduction would not be the appropriate technique based upon the primary flavor that we chose. Now emulsification would work. Emulsification is just combining water and fat together. So you could blend up the English peas after you blanch them. So you can blanch the English peas, put them into your blender, Maybe add a little bit of chicken stock, add a little bit of water, add a little bit of vegetable stock, depending upon the flavor profile you're going after. Start the blending process, blend, in, uh, blend them up. You could add in an egg yolk for a stabilizer, mustard for stabilizer, xanthan gum for a stabilizer, all these things we talk more about in our emulsification video series. And then emulsify with oil. Now you have, for lack of a better term, an English pea mayonnaise or an English pea emulsion is really a better term for it. And you can actually see this concept, which I'll put a link to in our show notes, in our sauce vierge video. And our sauce vierge is a tomato emulsion, and tomatoes are primary ingredient, and we just put secondary ingredients like basil and garlic and shallots, things that go good with tomatoes, and we emulsify with a little bit of canola oil, and we create this tomato emulsification that's beautiful in all certain different applications, whether using it as a spread on a sandwich or using it as a little swoosh on a plate. There's a lot of different things you can do with it. English peas work the exact same way. You just swap out the tomatoes with the English peas in our sauce vierge technique, Swap out some secondary flavor profiles that you want to go with your English peas, like some fresh mint, maybe some olive oil, maybe a little bit of mint shallot, and all of a sudden you have your own English pea emulsification. Now puree would also work because you could blanch the English peas and then create a stock using the English pea pods. So you take the English peas, you shuck them, now you have the peas, now you have the pods. So you take the pea pods, you use those as a base for a vegetable stock, maybe still add in some mirepoix, carrot, celery, onions, maybe some thyme, maybe some mint, okay, because mint goes good with peas. And you create a vegetable stock, and then you use that vegetable stock to puree your already blanched peas in the blender. Finish off with just a little touch of oil, which will emulsify in, but because you're not using the oil to thicken it, it's already thick from the puree, the oil is going to act more as a smoothing agent. It's going to smooth out your puree and give you a very nice mouthfeel. So now that you have a little bit of an overview of the three modern mother sauces and how you can apply flavor structure plus technique to create any sauce really, let's dive a little bit deeper into each one of these mother sauces. So reduction is the workhorse in a lot of professional kitchens. From this reduction becomes your demi-glosses, your jus. Any meat-based sauce is usually a reduction. Now in classic French cuisine and European style cooking, for the longest time, 
All of your meat-based sauces came from either Volute, which was a white stock thickened with a white roux, or Espanol, which was a brown stock thickened with a brown roux. Now, roux do have their place in cooking, but it's still best practice to reduce something. And in modern kitchens, more chefs are opting to omit starch thickeners and just do what's a, called a full reduction. And as you reduce the water out of your meat-based sauce, the gelatin that came from the stock making process and other particulate matter will concentrate and thicken your sauce. This gives your demi glace or your meat-based reductions a beautiful, shiny appearance and a really nice mouthfeel, not to mention an extremely robust flavor because it's all just concentrated flavors. So most reductions are going to be stock-based. Now, if you wanna be able to thicken through reduction, you're going to need a gelatin-based stock. So you're going to need to start with bones, okay? Chicken bones, duck bones, pork bones, veal bones, beef bones, okay? Because it's that gelatin in that bone. You have the collagen, which is a connective tissue. As you simmer that collagen in the bones, the collagen unravels. It's a triple helix of gelatin, so it unravels into individual gelatin strands. And as you reduce the moisture out of your stock, it will become thicker. And most of that thickness is actually going to come from the gelatin during you know, making that stock from the bones. But that doesn't mean that all of your reductions need to be a meat stock base. You could easily have start with a vegetable stock or any other sort of liquid that you reduce and add flavor to. Because part of the process of reduction is a reinforcement and reduction step. So anytime we are making a reduction style sauce in our kitchen, we are always going through a reinforcement and reduction step. So even when we make a beautiful flavored chicken stock or veal stock, when it comes time to turn that stock into a sauce, what do we do? Well, we reduce it to concentrate the flavors. Now, while we're reducing it to concentrate those flavors, doesn't it just make sense to add more flavor in? So we reduce and reinforce. So as we're reducing our veal stock, we'll add in beef trimmings that we've roasted. We'll add in some fresh diced mirepoix, some thyme, some garlic, some peppercorns, whatever it is that we want that stock's flavor or that finished sauce's flavor to pick up on. So you go through a reinforcement and reduction step. So even if you are not using a meat-based stock, you still wanna take that stock that you have, whether it's a vegetable base or a wine base or an alcohol base. And as you reduce it to concentrate flavors, you're adding in more flavors, which is just going to give you a more flavorful stock. Now, as we continue with this example, let's just make the assumption for a moment that we're trying to make a modern day demi gloss. So this is a pan sauce that is paired with all sorts of proteins and high end restaurants. And a modern demi gloss doesn't use any starch thickeners. And it's really the litmus test by which you can judge a chef's ability to make sauces. So we start with our stock. Our reductions are stock based. So in this case, we're trying to make a demi gloss. So we're gonna start with a roasted veal stock. Then after we've tra uh, strained that roasted veal stock, we're going to go through a reinforcement and reduction step. So as we reduce this stock, we're going to reinforce it with fresh mirepoix, some reduced red wine, some more thyme, and we are going to reduce to at least one half its original volume. Now what that's giving us is a very flavorful, concentrated sauce base, and because of the gelatin is in there and some of the water has evaporated, it's naturally gonna be thicker. But it's not ready to use just yet. Now as you are simmering your stocks and as you are reducing them, the flavors will meld and change and they won't be as the, the same as when you first started with that stock. So that's why in every single step, it's important to add or reinforce new flavors as you're reducing it all the way up until the last step, which is the finishing step. So at the restaurant, instead of reducing by one half its original volume, we reduce it to one quarter its original volume. So we, we're starting with a very reduced sauce. So we have our stock, we reinforce and reduce it with trimmings and mirepoix, and we reduce it down to one quarter of its original volume. So now let's pretend that we're serving this with a filet of beef. And we're gonna do a classic pan roast filet of beef. So what we're going to do is here is our pan, this is our saute pan, and I'm gonna stick my filet of beef right here in the center of this pan, and I'm gonna roast it, or I'm gonna sear it. 
okay? Now, as I, after I flip that, I'm gonna pop it in my oven and allow it to finish. Pull the filet of beef out of my oven, and what do I wanna do? Well, of course I wanna take it out of the pan and let that filet of beef rest. So when you, when you slice into it, when you serve it to your guests and they slice into it, it has a nice even color all the way through and the juices aren't leaking out, right? Which will make it dry. So as that is resting, so I remove that from the pan, I allow that to rest over here to the side. And while it's resting, I'm going to use this pan to make my pan sauce or my final demi-gloss. So in this pan, you have what we call a fond, which are all those brown, nummy little bits that stick to the bottom of the pan. Now this fond is flavor. Now why would you wanna waste that flavor when you can add it to your sauce, right? You gotta make a pan sauce anyway, so don't waste that flavor, that's good stuff. So what you wanna do is harvest that fond by deglazing. Now this can be water, this can be white wine, red wine, whatever you want your flavor profile to be, it could be juice. Be careful if it's something like apple juice because it has sugar, so it could scorch but a little bit of moisture goes into the pan. Now also in that pan with the fond is some fat. Some of it's the fat that you use in the initial cooking and searing process. Some of it is fat that is naturally just leached out or rendered out of the protein that you're cooking. But that fat also has a ton of flavor too. So if you haven't burnt, burnt the bottom of your pan and you have a nice golden brown fond on the bottom or, or even a, a rich golden brown or dark golden brown, but it's not black and burnt, then before you deglaze this, and we'll talk about deglazing in a second, you can actually do another reinforcement step. So here, you can add shallots, garlic, onions, really anything that when you cook it in this hot pan that has that residual fat in it, as it browns, is going to add a complementary flavor to your sauce. So you can saute some shallots in that fat, which is commonly what we do at the restaurant. So we take the steak out of the pan, we have our fond, we have our fat, we let the steak rest, and we start sauteing up some shallots. And be careful when you grab the handle of that pan because it's gonna be hot, so use a towel. When those shallots are golden brown, or just a light fragrant brown, doesn't really matter, we're now going to deglaze the pan, and deglazing is just adding moisture. Now what that's gonna do is it's gonna cause some vigorous steaming. We're gonna take a wooden spatula, and we're gonna scrape off that fond, and that steam is gonna help re release that fond. Now, if we're using red wine or white wine, if you're using alcohol, that will add a reinforcement flavor. So a, a lot of times in a demi-gloss, we'll use red wine to deglaze. But you can just use water if you're adverse to alcohol, if you don't want that flavor. But it's important to note that your deglazing liquid should be reduced to it's almost dry. And that's gonna concentrate the flavors of your fond and it's also gonna to help to cook out the raw alcohol flavor if you're using alcohol or wine. Uh, but also too, so if you think about it, if you're just using water to deglaze, and then you add your beautifully reduced stock directly on top of that, uh, that water without reducing it till it's almost gone, then you're just going to have to reduce this stock longer. And if you don't reduce it properly, then you're going to have a watery or a weak sauce. So after you deglaze, you reduce so it's almost dry. So what are we doing there? We're adding another reinforcement and reduction step, right? So reinforcement and reduce, reinforcement and reduce. We're reinforcing our stock, our reduction sauce, with the flavor of the fond and the shallots and the moisture from our deglazing liquid, whether it's white wine or juice or water. So we reduce that down again to extract the flavors from the shallots and to extract the flavors from the fond. Now, if you're doing this step, this deglazing step, then you're going to want to strain it, okay? So what you do at this point is you don't have to strain it yet. From here, you add in your reinforced and reduced stock. And this is the final finishing steps of your demi-gloss. So as you reduce that stock even further, you want to just keep on reducing it gently until it's what we call nappe, which means it can coat the back of a spoon. Now, once your reduction sauce reaches the consistency that you want, now it's time for a three-part finishing step. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, now during this reduction phase, if you want some final fresh flavors in there, now is the time to add it. So you've deglazed, you've added your reduced and reinforced stock, and now you're going to reduce until it's thick enough to coat the back of a spoon. Now, while you're waiting for that stock to reduce, if you want fresh herbs like tarragon or thyme, some black peppercorns, this is the time to add it because that's going to, it's going to take about five to 10 minutes for this finished reduction to occur. So during that five to 10 minutes is the perfect time to throw in some fresh flavors because it's just enough time for that thyme, 
or that tarragon or the parsley to infuse into your sauce without making it have a cooked flavor. It's going to keep its fresh flavor. All right, so reduce until it coats the back of a spoon. And now it's time for a finishing step. So if you have all this stuff in your sauce, it's really best practice to strain through a fine chinois because that's going to give you the best mouthfeel. Now, if you're making this sauce at home and you don't feel like straining it and you don't mind the particulate matter in your sauce, then don't strain it. It's not a big deal. I mean, the sauce police, you know, we're not going to come and arrest you. But if you're at a high-end restaurant, you're making the sauce, people are looking for that velvety, smooth mouthfeel. So you need to strain it through a chinois. It's considered best practice. And it's considered, quite frankly, lazy if you don't. So you strain your sauce through the chinois into a separate pan because you still want to keep that, that sauce hot. And now it's time for your boom, boom, boom finishing steps. Now, the first thing you want to do is you want to add fat, which is normally butter. And the reason why you add fat is because it gives you that smooth, velvety mouthfeel. And the reason why you add butter is because butter is already an emulsification. It's 80% fat, 20% water. So as you add that little dollop of whole butter into your pan and you swirl it in, at this point, you want to take it off the heat or just use very low heat so the butter doesn't break. And you swirl that in. It's going to hold some emulsification. So if you add just straight like oil to this fat, or excuse me, if you add just straight oil as your fat to finish your reduction sauce, then it's going to be more difficult to emulsify that fat in. And you're going to have it separate. So you're going to have the fat on top and you're going to have a greasy mouthfeel. But if you emulsify in the fat, and since butter is the easiest fat to emulsify in with, and butter has an awesome flavor anyways, you swirl that pat of butter in off the heat just until that pat of butter dissolves into your sauce. That's going to give you a rich uh, mouthfeel. But what does butter do? Well, we talked about in our flavor PDF that fats in general can coat the palate and deaden flavors. So we need to counteract that because we're adding the fat for that rich velvety mouthfeel that's going to give our beautiful reduction sauce. But we want to make sure that we still have some great, clean, bright flavors as well. So the next thing you want to do is add acid. Now the acid will cut through the fat and it will elevate the other secondary flavor components in that sauce, giving you a better rounded flavor. Now traditionally, you just add a little squeeze of lemon juice, but this can be Moscato vinegar, or it could be sherry vinegar, anything that's acidic that works with your flavor profile can be added in a step. So see how you start with the stock up here and every time you go through each one of these steps, it's a technical step, right? It's part of the technique, it's part of best practice, but the flavors that you decide to add in each one of these steps will be what actually defines the overall flavor structure of that sauce. So you're taking flavor structure and you're painting it over the reduction sauce technique. So back to finishing, you add fat, you add the acid to help cut through that fat, but also fat and acid will counterbalance seasoning. So you need to check for salt. Now, in a lot of instances, because your pan reduction sauce has such an intense flavor, you'll check for salt and you'll say, you know what, it doesn't need any, it's fine. And a lot of times that's the case. And you can use salt somewhere else on the dish to even out the seasoning. So you can use like some flirt of cells, a little finishing touch, all of which we talked about in our F is for flavor PDF. But your three boom, boom, boom finishing steps after you strain your sauce is to swirl in some butter, add some acid, check for salt, serve, you're done. Put it on the plate. So again, you see that in this reduction technique, we go through our best practices of each time we reduce, we're reducing to concentrate flavors. Now you might be thinking, well, hey, well, wait a second. Well, what if I want to use a roux? You know, what if I want to use a cornstarch slurry? That's fine. But what are you doing? You're still thickening a sauce. You're still thickening a water-based sauce. So here, you're thickening a sauce using the combination of fat and water, which is known as an emulsification. Here, in this technique, in the puree technique, you're using plant particles or other particles that are blended up to thicken your sauce. So when it comes time to use a thickener, a starch thickener, you're only going to be doing them in the reduction category and even in the reduction category, it's still best practice to always reduce and reinforce flavors. So to me, a Thanksgiving Day gravy does not taste the same unless it is thickened with a brown roux. But when I'm making that Thanksgiving Day gravy, I'm still going to, the day before, I'm still going to make a roasted turkey stock. 
And then the next day, as I reduce that stock slightly to concentrate flavors, I might take the wing tips, take some fresh mirepoix, some fresh thyme, throw it in that stock as I'm reducing it. Now, because I'm not making a pan sauce with it, I'm not going to reduce it by, you know, to one quarter of its original volume, but I might reduce it to three quarters or one half its original volume, because what is that doing? It's giving me a more concentrated turkey flavor. More concentrated flavor equals more deliciousness. Then I'm going to add in my brown roux to thicken it, but it's also best practice to continue to simmer that roux because that roux is going to throw off proteins from the flour. And that protein from the flour is that scum that rises to the top. So you want to simmer for at least 20 minutes of a very slow heat and skim, 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 and skim off that protein or that scum that comes to the top. Now, when it comes time to serve your Thanksgiving Day gravy that's uh, gone through the reduction process and thickened with a beautiful golden brown roux, well, you still wanna go through your finishing steps. Gravy, even though it's a rich sauce, can definitely benefit in mouthfeel with a little bit of fat, whether it's butter that's swirled in or a little touch of cream. I like to do both because, hey, it's Thanksgiving, that's party, right? So a little touch of cream, a little swirl of butter. But again, what, what is that fat gonna do? It's gonna give me a great mouthfeel I'm going to have some really nice flavors for my reduction and reinforcement step, but I'm going to need some acid to help to cut the richness of that gravy. So I finish, after I put in the fat, I cut with some acid, and then I check for salt and seasoning. Now here is a public service announcement for you when you're making your roux. Do not use salted butter, because when you get to this step down here and you check for salt, you're going to be really disappointed because there's already going to be way too much salt from your roux. Okay, so when you're making your roux, always use unsalted butter. When making roux, always use unsalted butter. In fact, you should always use unsalted butter in general just because butter is an ingredient and salt is an ingredient. As a chef, you should always have control over your flavor profiles and having your butter and salt and keeping them separate is going to give you more control over the final flavor. So those are the three modern mother sauces. And with best practices in each technique category, when you understand those techniques and you paint flavor structure over the top, you can really create any dish that you want. So now when you open up a cookbook, you're opening up a cookbook for inspiration to see how that chef decided to combine his or her flavors together. And then you decide, hey, I'm gonna go down this path. You know, I'm gonna take this concept, but I'm gonna add a little bit of a Southeast Asian flair to it. And I'm gonna look up some Southeast Asian ingredients and kind of see like what they use for, for their sauces, to the flavor their sauces. And then I'm gonna make that my own, right? So by separating technique and flavor structure and then combining the two in your sauce creation, you can really create any sauce that you can really imagine. Now for more information, I want you to go to stellaculinary.com slash sauces. And on this page, you'll find this video with my smiling face. But more importantly, I will have all of our other videos that we categorize by reduction, emulsification, or puree as examples. So you can walk through those best practices. You can understand each technique as it is. And as you work your way through all of our other videos, you can look at the reductions and how we, we make our pan sauces. You can look at the science behind emulsifications and really grasp these concepts because once you understand these techniques then again all you're doing is you're painting flavor structure over technique and creating any sauce that you'd ever want to make also on this page is a comment section so go there sign up for a free username and password for the stella culinary community which is completely free to you and then in this comment section you can ask questions and i may do video responses i may do audio responses uh, I will write back responses, whatever it takes to get you to grasp this concept. Because it's very, very important that you have a good sauce game if you want to be a good cook. Now, in our next video, sort of the final in this series on flavor structure and technique, we're going to talk about creating your own recipes and what that entails. And if you have a recipe that you want help creating, let me know. Go over to stellacolor.com slash sauces, leave it in the comments there, and who knows, I might just feature your idea in an upcoming video.